Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Adam Bates. Joining us today is Mustafa Akul. He is the author of Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So we'll start with, for, for audience that doesn't know much about it, what is Islam? What are the, the basics of it, the thumbnail sketch, I suppose, if such a thing can be given? Sure. Uh, Islam is the world's second largest religion in a very demographic you know, definition. Um, but theologically speaking, Islam is, I think, yet another episode in this long saga of Abrahamic monotheism. You know, with Abraham began the religion that we know as Judaism today. And sometime like in the first century, according to our current calculations, with Jesus and Paul, you know, it had a branch that, that became Christianity. And Islam is the third big episode in that tradition because Islam itself ties its doctrines and its origin to Abraham, uh, the God of Abraham. That's the God of Muhammad. And uh, we should just recall that before Islam, Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, was a mainly pagan, polytheistic uh, place. And Islam, therefore, was an affirmation, a proclamation of monotheism uh, against a polytheistic pagan society. Uh, and, and the ba basic motto of Islam reads, there is no God but the God. And that's basically saying that all these pagan gods or war god, agriculture, love god, and you know, they don't exist. There's only one god that is the creator of heavens and earth, and that's Abraham, Abraham's god. Uh, I should, though, add that when you compare Islam to other, you know, sister religions, t Westerners typically tend to compare Islam to Christianity, the main religion within the West. Like, oh, Muhammad is like uh, Jesus, and Quran is like the New Testament. Uh, not exactly. I think Islam should be compared to Judaism because I think those two faiths are closer to each other in the sense that Muhammad is a figure exactly like Moses, like a human being who receives revelation and, and maybe Moses plus Joshua because there's a, like a military leadership as well. And, and the Quran is a book like the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament a little bit in terms of speaking. Of, it doesn't speak about Muhammad himself. It speaks about God, creation, you know, heavens, afterlife. There's more emphasis in afterlife for sure in Islam than Judaism. That's one difference. But both religions, both Judaism and Islam ha have a notion of divine law, which is halakha in Judaism and sharia in Islam. And uh, whether all aspects of the law are eternally valid and, you know, still has to be implemented today is a big question. And Muslims are, you know, divided into different groups. Some think that all aspects of Islamic law, which is, you know, Sharia, has to be implemented today, including the penal code. And, you know, you, if you do that, you end up like being Saudi Arabia uh, in a moderate version and even their harsher versions or Iran, but, but other Muslims think that, well, that's historical, that's a part of our religious tradition, but today uh, what I need to do as a Muslim is just to be a pious, observant individual, like, you know, doing my prayers and fasting in Ramadan, certain rituals and having certain faith doctrines. So there's a spectrum, of course, among Muslims about what it exactly means. But I can say it's, it's a religion that is not that different from Ju Judaism and Christianity from its, from its beginnings and, and perspective, of course, it had a different history. Uh, and I think a lot of the tensions that appeared between Muslims and Christians, and Muslims and Jews, and the tensions between Muslims and Jews are very new. That's a 20th century phenomenon. But between Muslims and Christians, that was a matter of geopolitics as well. I mean, Ottoman Empire fight the uh, Austria-Hungarians. Not It was not a battle over Quran or over the Gospels, it was a, it's a war of empires. So there has been a lot of geo, geopolitical tension between Muslims and non-Muslims uh, over the Mediterranean and uh, in Europe. Uh, but if you leave that aside, if you look at the theology, the doctrines, we should see those commonalities between Islam and the other, the older monotheisms. You make the 
looking at the, the state of the Islamic world today, um, it doesn't appear from outside that political liberalism goes hand in hand with Islam. Um, but you, you make the claim that historically the – from the Quran and the early Islamic teachings are – look much more liberal or supportive of liberalism than what we often see now. Um, so how did we get from there to here? Is this – did the, the kind of illiberalism – was that a fairly early arriving feature? Is it a fairly recent feature? Was that that story? First of all, I should say that in the past two centuries, we are going through what I call and what other scholars have called the crisis of Islam. We're probably living in the darkest era of the whole Islamic civilization today. Uh, why is that? It's a huge question. But this is not an this is not an era of Islam that many Muslims are proud of. Uh, th that's that's one thing I should say. Secondly, of course, political liberalism is a modern idea. So you can't just find liberalism in the modern sense way back in any probably pre-modern society. But one thing I emphasize in my book is that there are certain roots uh, and examples of freedom you find in classical Islam, relatively speaking, you know, according to that time and age, that is forgotten later, that you know, Islamic world moved away from the freedom and tolerance and diversity you f have in the very beginning and it's gradually stagnated and, and turned into a more rigid doctrine. Uh, one thing, I mean, the early Islam had a lot of different theological and jurisprudential schools, in some of which I find really important rational ideas and some even liberal ideas, and liberal in the sense that those schools accepted that people should not be punished for being heretics or, uh, or blasphemous and, and religion should not be imposed and coerced. So there are schools who actually got that in the very beginning early centuries of Islam. However, gradually an orthodoxy formed and that orthodoxy both in Sunni and Shia world uh, was in, in certain ways authoritarian. Like you should protect the community, you should impose certain practices. If someone blasphemes against God, you know, you should punish that person, execute that person. So like a jurisprudence developed and it was about protecting the community and protecting its unity and against diversity uh, and using the powers of the state to make – to sustain the religiosity of society became an established norm. Yet since the 19th century, uh, there have been a series of Islamic reformers, intellectuals that we call the Islamic liberals or the Islamic modernists. These people first looked at Europe. Well, they didn't know about U.S. much at the time. It was too far. But they looked at Europe and realized there are a lot of things to admire there, like scientific progress, you know, justice system, you know, rule of law. There are many things that they look at the Islamic world and they realize how backward many Muslim societies were. And they said this – well, this was actually a recognition for everybody in the 19th century. I mean like the West is so advanced and we are not. And actually every ideology in the Islamic world begins with this you know, observation. Some people said – we call them the secularists. They said, well, we are backward because religion is a problem. So let's get rid of religion. So they established autocratic secular systems. Uh, that's not my cup of tea because that's authoritarian in the first place as well. The Islamic modernists said, well, w obviously there is a problem here in our you know, civilization right now. But maybe because we got rid of the founding more enlightened values of Islam because there was a time that Islam was advanced. There was a time that the world's biggest libraries was not in Paris or London but in Baghdad and Cordoba. There was a time Muslims were the uh, place where scientific discoveries were made. There was a time the Muslim world were freer than the West and that's why Jews who were persecuted 
in Spain, you know, came to Ottoman Empire to be saved from religious persecution. So they wanted to revive that lost openness and rationality of Islam. So that's why they began to question these things. And that tradition is still there, and I still believe in that tradition and its potential to revitalize the Islamic faith with, of course, some modification over time. We're in the 21st century. Uh, but why Islam is in this shape, it's a big question. And there are, I think, different answers given to it. But there are few Muslims who think we are fine. I mean, many Muslims are thinking there's a problem with the shape of the Islamic world today. Uh, people like me want to find a solution in rediscovering some fundamental values, which will allow us a more liberal formula today. There are some people who think we are in a big crisis because we are not religious enough. We have to make everybody more religious. We have to impose it by the state. So that's the kind of authoritarian response. But every almost ideological current in the Islamic world today begins with the recognition that there's something wrong. So you mentioned earlier about these schools of thought that um, there were liberal elements even in the very early centuries. Um, of Islam, but for for listeners who may not know that much about the structure of, of Islam, could you? Uh, my understanding is Islam is a very decentralized religion. There's not yeah. a, a central authority. So could you discuss that yeah. a little bit and the 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 pros and cons, I sure. guess, of having such a decentralized faith? Sure. Again, if to to make an analogy, Islam is a bit more like Protestantism than Catholicism when it comes to that issue of centralization versus decentralization. There is no central authority. People will say, well, there is a caliphate. There was the caliphate. But even when the caliphate exists, the caliphate was not a religious authority. The caliphate was the political authority, the political leadership of Muslims. Uh, and uh, since the beginning, Islam didn't have an institution like the church in the Catholic sense, which would have this authoritative, you know, dic dic like dictums on the, you know, the right doctrine. You just had different schools of thought. And people were drawn to the school of thought, that school of thought. And there were tensions sometimes between them. There was also coexistence as well. Uh, and that spectrum, of course, includes disturbing schools of thought and also more inspiring ones. So I'm interested in the more inspiring ones, obviously. For example, one school of thought in early Islam that I find fascinating is the group called Murgia in Arabic. Murgia in Arabic means the postponers. Now, why were they called the postponers? Because these, uh, these were Muslim theologians who emerged in the middle of a big dispute uh, in the Muslim world between the supporters of Ali, the fourth caliph, and Muawiyah, the fifth caliph. So there was a big time of civil war and conflict. And there were fanatics who were really excommunicating fellow Muslims and killing them. Uh, they said, wait a minute. We cannot decide who's a good Muslim and who's a bad one and who's a heretic. Only God has the authority to judge people. And God will judge people in afterlife. So on earth, let's postpone this issue of who's right and wrong and just leave it to God to be s sorted out when we die in afterlife. That's why they were called postponers, murgia. Uh, and I think that was a brilliant base for a theological you know, approach to pluralism and, and freedom. Uh, and it's not an accident, for example, in last year, ISIS in one of its monthly magazines devoted 16 pages to condemn the heresy of Murgia. And they said this is the most dangerous heresy in the whole Muslim world. Why? Because it tells you to postpone your judgment to afterlife. It deprives you from the authority to kill people in the name of God because you say God should sort it out. I can't do it. So it, it's calling for humility. And ISIS is totally disturbed by this idea. So that's one, for example, uh, root of a proto-liberal, if you will, theology I find in, in medieval Islam. There was also another school of thought called Mutazila, which has been also noticed by a lot of Western scholars. They, I think they're important in terms of rationality in Islam. They emphasize that Muslims believe in scripture, the Quran, it's from God, but they said reason is a faculty given by God. So through reason too, we can find truth. And that's how, for example, they benefited from reading Aristotle. I mean, Aristotle is obviously not an Islamic scholar. So a traditional conservative would say, we shouldn't read that. That's un-Islamic. But they said, 
he has reason. So Aristotle is a rational thinker, and if he, he established certain truths with reason, so they could read Aristotle and synthesize it with Islamic thought. Uh, and I think they are, they are also important in terms of emphasizing free will versus predestination. These are kind of important theological roots if you want to build a liberal argument today. And I'm, so therefore, I'm not going to say Islamic world was liberal you know, in the modern sense in the beginning, but there are certain teachings in, in classical Islam that have been forgotten a little bit, but I think we can revive today to build an argument for liberalism for Muslims today. Along those lines, you, there's a couple of things you mentioned that, again, may seem striking um, from our perspective today, which is you say first that the, the Quran, you say, introduced into Arab society the concept that individuals have inalienable rights and then also that it, it recognized rights for women. Um, how did it do those? How does that, those show yeah. up in it? Yeah, that's, that's a point made by Islamic feminists. You know, that We have people like that, Islamic feminists. And here's the problem. I mean, today, the Muslim world is not a great place for, you know, equality and, you know, emancipation for women. In, and again, I'm speaking in a very generalizing sense because the life of a Muslim woman in Bosnia and Afghanistan are incredibly different. One is very Western and, and modern. The, one, the other one is very traditional and, and unequal. So Muslim world is diverse. But we have serious problems when it comes to women's rights in is countries that claim to impose Islamic law have Islamic uh, jurisprudence, such as Iran, Saudi Arabia. And Iran is actually better than Saudi Arabia in, on that issue, but there are issues there. Uh, however, in the very beginning, when Islam appeared in 7th century Arabia as a new religion, one of its teachings was that women have rights too. And for that society, that was like something new. Uh, women have property rights. Like with Islam, women gained the right to own property, which is, which was new because women were themselves property before, before Islam. Uh, women gained the right to reject a marriage. And for example, when a, wedding, a, a, a uh, marriage took place, there was a money given to fathers. Islam said give it to the woman herself as an economic guarantee for herself. So there have been certain improvements in women's rights. It wasn't full equality, but it was a major improvement. And uh, so we have Islamic feminists in the Muslim world today. Most of them are females, pious women, who say Islam in the be beginning was a religion that liberated women. But however, over time, it lost that early impetus. And uh, since it was only males who interpreted the Quran for centuries, they interpreted in a sense that emphasizes male domination over women. So we have to reread it today. And I think that's an important way to move forward in the Islamic world today because a feminism that is fed only by non-Western sources of inspiration will have contributions, but it will have some roadblocks. But a feminism that is also inspired by the values within the religion, I think will have more impact. And, and we, we see that in, in different Muslim societies. You mentioned that they came up, so I have to ask because this is one of the. Uh, I'm sure our listeners are curious, um, and I don't know for sure, but what is the, what is the difference between the the two, the Shiite and the the Sunni sects? Oh, okay. And is one of them generally more amenable to the liberal or proto-liberal yeah. arguments than the other? It depends. <laughs> I think it is hard to say. Sunnis or Shiites are more open to this and that. I mean, I think within both traditions, you have a spectrum. You have liberal-leaning Shiites. You have very conservative and maybe radical, sometimes violent Shiite groups. And you can say the same thing among, among Sunnis as well. Well, the big, the big difference is uh, the way they actually frame... F well, they, they began with a political dispute. Let's put it that way. Uh, Islam, in Islam, early Islam, the disputes were political because there was political power at hand. Whereas in Christianity, there was no political power until Rome became Christian. So it was all the doctrine, you know, nature of Christ was the big issue. In Islam, well, the nature of the Quran was an issue too, I will give that. But big disputes took over, uh, began with political conflicts. So the Shiites uh, basically said, after Prophet Muhammad, the legitimate authority of leadership among Muslims belongs to the bloodline of the prophet. 
his household. So his nephew, Ali, and then it goes on, you know, like that, and Ali's descendants. So they think the leadership is a matter of like a hereditary uh, system. Whereas Sunni said, no, whoever is pious can be the leader of the community, uh, which meant that Shiites always believed in this lineage. So they always had a living imam. They call imam, and imam is an important, more important concept, concept in Shiites among Muslims. They always had some living authority to which they could subscribe to. And today it's the Ayatollahs. You know, probably Americans know that word Ayatollah from Ayatollah Khomeini, but he was not the only one. Which means the Shiite tradition is a bit more open to theocracy, like you have one living big person that you have to follow, but also it is a bit more easily updatable, reformable, because there's always a living authority who can make a new decision on something. Whereas the Sunni tradition is following basically the texts of major scholars who lived in the 9th, 10th centuries. So it is less open to theocracy, but it's also a bit frozen. There's less jurisprudential renewal within, within the Sunni tradition. Um, besides than that, I mean, actually, I mean, there's no dispute over the text of the Quran, but this, this has been the basic issue, who has the legitimate authority after Prophet Muhammad. But these also developed a certain different sources, you know, like which hadiths you accept, words of Prophet Muhammad, Shiites have different sources, Sunnis have different sources. And ultimately, I will say today, the conflict, let's say, in Iraq and Syria between Sunnis and Shiites is a conflict less about theology but more about power because these identities have also turned into almost ethnic identities. When you say, I'm Shia, you say, I belong to this group. And that group has a demand or like a grievance or something in that country. It is a bit like, in that sense, the current conflict is a bit like Northern Ireland conflict where you had Protestants and Catholics fighting for Northern Ireland. It was less directly theological. It was more about these two groups claiming to dominate the same country, which is Northern Ireland. And you have that dichotomy in Iraq or Syria now. So the terms in about Islam that we as Westerners hear in the news and whatever. So we've got the, the Sunnis and Shiites, but then the other one, um, Adam is from Oklahoma, and they have passed legislation about this one. Is is Sharia law? Okay. Uh, so, what is Sharia law, and what role does it play in the the political systems and this this tension between mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. theocracies and more liberal states? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Uh, well, actually, the term Sharia law is redundant. Sharia by itself means divine law. It actually means the way to the water path, the path to the water source. Uh, but OK, Sharia t technically means divine law. And you never actually implement Sharia. You actually implement fiqh, which is jurisprudence, so which is the actual implementation of that ideal of Sharia. But these are technicalities. Here's this thing. Islam has a body of laws. That's right. And that a part of that is about personal practice. Like Sharia tells me that I should not eat pork. And when I do not eat pork, liberal democracies are not threatened, right? It's my personal choice. If I do my Friday prayers, that is a part of Sharia and my, my, my Ramadan fast. It's my personal observance. Or like, should Muslim women cover their hair? I mean, traditional interpretations of Sharia will say yes. So that's a part of their, her observance. Some modernists would say, no, that's not necessary. It just means a modest dress. So there's a different you know, tradition, like an interpretation there as well. But some part of Sharia is about how to be a Muslim as a person. And there's no problem with that. But also, because partly because Islam always had a state, the governing of that state was a question. So Sharia gradually included issues about public life, about the legal system, about the penal code, and ultimately even governance, like what's the ideal state? So if you go back to some medieval scholars of the Sharia, like Maverdi, for example, he defines what the ideal state should be, and that's what God wants. Now, if you say that has to be the case today, then you will end up being a challenge to liberal democracy because that Sharia state uh, envisions a social order in which people don't have individual freedom to the fullest. Like apostates are given death penalty. 
like if you're an apostate from Islam, if you're a Muslim and you get, give up and become a Buddhist or Christian, you're given death penalty. I mean, that's a serious, you know, violation of religious freedom. Blasphemy is considered as a crime punishable by death. So there are aspects of Sharia that are certainly illiberal, authoritarian, and they, they should raise concern for anybody who believes in these liberal values. Uh, all, are all Muslim countries in the world implementing this Sharia? No. Actually, there are five or six states that in which Sharia laws are fully implemented. Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, Sudan, Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, a few. And in some Arab countries, in Egypt, for example, it's only within the matters of civil, uh, sorry, religious marriage and, you know, like civil law. It's not penal code. So most Muslim nations don't have Sharia being practice, practiced. That's war. I mean, it would be a stretch to think it would come to Oklahoma. I mean, it should come to Egypt and Turkey and Tunisia and Morocco first before it goes all the way to Oklahoma. Well, so, as the uh, as the resident Oklahoman who was who was in the state during yeah. the uh, during that Sharia debate in two thousand uh, and ten, um, yeah. In, insofar as there are Sharia courts, you mentioned the the Jewish halakha law yeah. earlier. Uh, there have been Jewish halakha courts in the U.S. for decades, for and decades, they handle in the U.K. too, yeah. right? And they handle uh, arbitration. They handle civil civil disputes. If you contract with someone for an agreement or for a marriage, and you want uh, any disputes that arise to be adjudicated according to the religious law by religious officials, uh, we allow that. Freedom of religion allows you yeah. to to contract that way. And of course, any determinations of the arbitration court have to be uh, entered by an actual court that so you can't contract for things like slavery or, or things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, when Sharia as its practice, Sharia courts as they're practiced in the US is just voluntary arbitration yeah. agreements, but they have this reputation of uh, if we allow Sharia law in Oklahoma, we're, we're going to be chopping the hands off of thieves and things of that nature. But there's just there seems to be this severe um, misunderstanding about what Sharia is yeah. and, and how these courts operate. Yeah. I mean, there can be people who wants to chop off hands in Oklahoma and somewhere else, but I think they would be very marginal, and I would be against them as Muslim myself because I personally think that, I mean, the, the principles of Sharia, and that's an interesting discussion. Medieval scholars also discussed the actual implementation of Sharia, the actual injunctions, and the intentions behind them called makasset in Arabic. And I those intentions they define as the protection of life, religion, lineage, property, and intellect. So that's pretty liberal when you look at the intention side. Uh, but anyway, the Sharia can be a threat to human freedom if it is implemented as a penal code, as a law of the land, and that happens in these countries. But to, but to look at to looking at this and ask from every Muslim to condemn the Sharia would be wrong because many Muslims still respect the concept. It's a God-given, you know, divine notion, but they don't think it is valid for every state and society. Uh, every and there are many Muslims in Turkey like that. For there are many. Turkey is a predominantly Muslim country, and there are very conservative Muslims who wear the headscarf and who fast in Ramadan. They make maybe make some 50 percent of Turkish society. But when people are asked, do you want a Sharia state in Turkey? The support for that drops to 10 percent. And that's a Pew Research Center poll. And in Bosnia, that drops to 0.2 percent. Well, in, in, in Egypt, it's higher. In Pakistan, it's higher. So every society is different. So w we should be aware that the Sharia includes uh, certain injunctions that are illiberal, and that's why I spent a lot of time in my book, you know, go over, going over those and revisiting them and reinterpreting them and questioning and criticizing them. But on the other hand, to think that every Muslim is a walking Sharia agent, you know, trying to implement that, that would be also an, an ex big exaggeration. But so, in, and for our listeners, Sharia doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to every Muslim, right? I mean, it, at least in the uh, in an example that might make more sense to non-Muslims, just saying somebody is a Christian uh, does not tell you their view on war. It doesn't tell you their view on the criminal justice system. It doesn't tell you their view on abortion, gay rights. I mean, all of these issues have people who are devout Christians on either side who would uh, say that their their devout devotion to to their Christian faith compels them to this to these opposite results. Uh, so, do you think that's the same? Is this the same true of of, of Sharia that it's not a it's not a monolith? It doesn't mean the same thing to every person. Absolutely. Uh 
the people who would go and condemn the Sharia in the Islamic world would be what we call the secularists. You know, they would want to see no religion in public space. And uh, but uh, and other Muslims, however, most of them would be appreciative of liberal values, and they would say, "Well, Sharia has some aspects that are historical. We don't think they should be implemented today, but it was written in classical books." And when you look at the history of the Islamic civilization, when you look at the late Ottoman Empire, for example, the Ottomans rendered the Sharia obsolete on, in many cases. They thought, you know, as times change, laws should change. That's a dictum the Ottomans had in the beginning of their great 19th century codification of law called Mejelle. So indeed, uh, when you see, you know, women being stoned to death in the name of Sharia, that's a matter of concern and that should be a problem that we should stand up against. But also we should understand that indeed Muslims understand it in very different ways. And uh, probably the majority of Muslims in the world do not want to see that happen and, and, and to, they don't want to see that happen, especially in Western societies where Muslims are minority because Sharia is a law that is meant to be for Muslims. I mean, you're subject to Sharia if you are Muslim. So uh, in the middle of like Western Europe, Western, Western America, Oklahoma. like Oklahoma, probably you will never have the urge to implement Sharia anyway. Probably all you want is to be you know, a good Muslim without being, uh, your rights being violated. So on this topic of what parts of Islamic teachings are the ones that are we can interpret or we can set aside or we can view as contextual to their time and place versus the more core ones. You, you mentioned this story um, that then becomes, I think, an important part of your, your the argument for liberalism within Islam of Muhammad giving basically bad advice to, is it date farmers? Okay, uh, yeah. And, and how that sets up this distinction between his ideas and the ideas that, I guess, came through uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, sure. That's an interesting point. That argument is an argument against, theoc- against theocracy also as well. Well, we have a few stories from the life of Prophet Muhammad. And one of them, for example, is the one you mentioned. Another one, which is my favorite actually, which is in my book as well, is that during a battle, just night before the battle, the army has to camp somewhere. And, and Prophet Muhammad says, we can camp here. And then one of his disciples come and say, ask him, is this your idea or is this a revelation from God? And he says, it's not a revelation. It's just my idea. When it is his idea, the, the man says, okay, I have a different idea. Let's do it this way. And Prophet Muhammad listens to him and follows his advice. And actually, that's a helpful advice. That's what we learn from the Islamic tradition. Now, this means that the early Muslim community made a distinction between divine commandments and human decisions. And Prophet Muhammad was even questioned it's a human decision. Now, I use this as an argument against theocracy saying that Prophet Muhammad, who was receiving revelation from God, was even questioned, you know, in his human decisions. And after Prophet Muhammad, according to Islam, that there's nobody that receives a divine revelation. We just have the teachings there. So we are all equal Muslims who just have the teachings and we can go read and learn and there can be more learned people, but there's nobody to which we should obey without questioning. Uh, so that, that, that was about that. Uh, and basically, Islam is a religion in the sense, as I said, lack, that lacks the institution like a church. So there is no actually intermediary between man and God. That can be an advantage and disadvantage, though. That means that also a radical, violent, you know, cleric can come out and have his own crazy interpretation and can follow, have a following, and it happens. But it also means Islam is open to individualism. It is open to seeing religion as something between man and God, so it therefore liberates the man from the yoke of the state or society and empowers him as an individual. And is there something – so when we look at – again, in the West, because there's – I mean with Trump in power now, there's a lot of – Islam is in the news um, often in fairly depressing ways. Um, but – so – one of the image the image is that there's something uniquely violent about this religion that the the terrorism that we see worldwide is feels like it's more often than not islamic terrorism um so this isn't quite the same as like questions of political liberalism um and so then this gets spun into well we have to you know the muslim ban that trump tried to enact um we have to keep 
these people out because they will bring violence along with their religion. Is there is that is that violence is there something in Islam that makes it say more susceptible to that kind of violent extremism or is that something that's coming in from outside for other causes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, if we went back to like four centuries ago and looked at Christendom in the 16th century, maybe we would say, is there something about Christianity that makes it violent? Actually, Voltaire said in one of his writings that no kingdom other than the kingdom of Christ has seen so much internal war and conflict. That was the case of Christians in in the wake of the and during the Protestant Reformation, Catholics and Protestants slaughtering each other. Well, Christianity took a lesson from that and moved forward and came to the liberal solution of you know pluralism and freedom. Uh, we have not been there yet, so that that's the problem we see in the in the Muslim world today. That's one thing I would add. So it's like a, that's why I'm calling a crisis of Islam. It's, it doesn't define the whole nature of this 14th century civilization. It's a current crisis. Plus, I would add. This is mainly a Middle Eastern conflict, Middle Eastern and partly, you know, subcontinent too. Uh, and when you look at the Christian communities that happen to be there, you can see some acts of violence as well. When you look at the Lebanese civil war, for example, the warring parties were Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, and Lebanese Christian militia. And, and both sides, all sides were equally violent. So sometimes the, con the, the conflict that takes place within a region because of factors other than religion, because of land disputes, because of war over resources and ethnicity and all that, makes the religion that happens to be there more militant. It's not that region, religion is causing militancy there, but it is becoming a vehicle for that. Uh, I mean, when you look at, for example, Africa, um, there is a organization called Lord's Resistance Army in the middle of Africa, and it's a pretty violent Christian uh, militia, like the Boko Haram in, 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 in the same region. Of course, the world's majority of Christians will be horrified to see such kinds of violent people in the name of their faith. But that exists in Africa in a certain context where people go over conflict and war, over resources, and so on and so forth. Therefore, I, th I sometimes think we also sometimes over-religionize things that are also political in nature or cultural or sociological in nature. So that's also something I would add to the table. Middle East is a very dra traumatized region for a lot of reasons. Colonial heresy, dict dictatorial governments, the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, and wars and conquests and so on and so forth. That sometimes radicalizes a religion other than really religion radicalizing the region. So then would it be fair to look at it, you know, one of the things that seems to be present in the areas where we see violent extremism of any kind, but we certainly, this seems to be present a lot in, in the Middle East and the parts of, say, Europe where there's violent extremism is a large, large groups of basically unemployed young men on the fringes of society. Um, so is, and, and those groups unemployed young men on the fringes of society have kind of always been a problem. Wherever you have that, regardless of the Those ideology. Those men are a problem everywhere. They, they, you end up with we want to get them. We should get them employed. That's, yes. that's what. Uh, and so is there like, so they might have turned at one point in history, they, they might have turned to communism, you know, communism yeah, to yeah. violent forms of communism or whatever. Anar so is there. Violent anarchism. Yeah. So in related to the, the, the violence comes into the faith, is it, is there a sense to where Islam has become like if you are a disaffected young man who's violent and kind of has this, you know, you're looking for something to latch on to. The thing now is these certain views of Islam and so you're attracted to that and so you bring yeah. the violence with yeah. you. Exactly. That's that's a pattern that you can see. I mean French uh, expert on Islam, Olivier Roy, that's why he said that we are not seeing – uh, radical Islam, we are seeing the Islamization of radicalism. Like radicalism is there out of these social political dynamics, but it just takes an Islamic guard right now. Like the Palestinian issue would be a great example. Like look at 
the Palestinian territories today, which are the violent groups that you know Israel, Israel attacks as ter- Israel considers as terrorists? Hamas, Hezbollah, these are Is- Islamic Jihad. Yeah, these are all you know Islamic groups. Go back to 30 years ago, there were no Islamic groups uh, in Palestine, but there were still armed groups that are fighting Israel called the uh, PLO and uh, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Actually, one of their leaders was George Habash, a Palestinian Christian of Marxist ideology. So there is a tension in Palestine, and that comes out in, in – that radicalizes, and that comes out in different ideological forms. And Islamism is a good form. I mean, religion is always a great way to mobilize people if there's anger and, and there's some grievance. So I, I'm not saying this to say – there's no doctrinal issue in Islam. There is, I mean, certainly, and I'm working on those. But I'm saying this to also understand that problems that are affecting religion are sometimes coming with sources that are there. And the solutions will be found when we employ those young men, give them a country, sometimes if they feel occupied, and 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 try to create middle class societies where you have jobs, opportunities, and so on and so forth. So the radical interpretations will not become that attractive. Uh, so how would – I'm assuming most of our audience is non-Muslim and Western. Um, so how – what advice, if any, would you have to to non-Muslims who are interested in – and you make the argument that there is this Islamic case uh, for liberalism. Um, but there seems to be a pretty thin line, right, between uh, – urging Muslims to reform in a, in a liberal direction within their own faith, but uh, at the same time to convince Western non-Muslims uh, that, that Islam is not inherently no. authoritarian. So how, how, do you, how do you manage that, that tension between uh, urging this liberal reformation in Islam and at the same time putting, putting people at ease in the West that uh, Islam is not inherently mm-hmm. incapable of doing this? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a tough thing I'm trying to do for a long time. Uh, and I'll say there are even some kind of false hopes that you know disillusion me, like Turkey, my country. I had much better hopes about it in terms of its liberal democratic credentials. Sadly, it didn't work that way. But anyway, well, I, well, I tried to do that by being honest. I mean, yes, we have issues in Islam to sort out. Yes, we have issues with the Sharia. Uh, if we want to be a pious Muslim compatible with our sources, we have to do some rethinking and revisiting, uh, both in terms of jurisprudence and theology. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying this to fellow Muslims. I'm saying this to not Westerners as well. I'm just telling Westerners that, but understand that, you know, the problems I'm describing is not the only thing about Islam. And there's there are Muslims who are already trying to change these things. There are Muslims who have already found ways to cope with liberal modernity, even without they didn't gone through like a theoretical reform. By nature, people just adopt. I mean, so, but I'm trying to do that exactly, speaking to Muslim communities and trying to push for change. And when I speak to Western society, I'll, I'm honest, we have problems, but also uh, beware of those people who will show you only those problems and will tell you that's all Islam is about. And that's, that's, that's not going to – and that's wrong. And that doesn't help us, by the way. I mean, Islamophobia doesn't help Muslim reformists because the argument of the radical Islamists is that the West is our enemy. There's no place for us in liberalism. We have to fight it. And when the voice coming from the liberal world is hostility towards Islam, then they feel vindicated, whereas we need to keep that bridge working. Well, I've always thought it was kind of interesting that the uh – these Islamophobic voices in the West and these Islamic authoritarian voices, uh, they promote the same version of Islam. Yeah, their conception they, they of Islam. They all is agree the that Islam is a violent, intolerant <laughs> religion. Just, you know, the radicals are proud of that. The others are horrified about that, but they agree on the definition of Islam. And then the rest of us are, the in, the, are us in the middle. Are, in the middle, we are horrified about what this vicious cycle that's going on. Then looking forward, as you said that there's this crisis in Islam right now, this that needs to resolve, how do you see it resolving? Um, and are you, are you optimistic about it resolving in a, in a good way? Well, this is a crisis that will go on. I mean, I think we are, civilizations don't change overnight. I mean, sometimes people ask me, you've been writing about this for a decade. Why hasn't all the Muslim world become Norway? Or like, well, things take time, you know. 
uh, Christianity didn't evolve overnight, you know, from its own medieval dark eras into like a liberal society. Uh, but this is a battle that's fighting for. And this is a battle that needs to be pursued. Uh, and, you know, there are failed dreams and false hopes. There are some good examples too. Look at Tunisia today. You will be inspired with the work that, you know, the Islamists in Tunisia have done in a moderate way with, you know, agreeing with the secular. So there are some positive examples as well. I'm trying to bring in sources of inspiration. I mean, actually, I just had a piece in the New York Times a few weeks, a few days ago, titled What Jesus Can Teach Muslims Today, because uh, there I argue that Muslims think that Jesus is a prophet, but what do we learn from Jesus? And uh, one thing Jesus did, I think, at his time was to call people, his fellow Jews, to look at the meaning of law rather than just the uh, injunctions of it. And that purpose and meaning of law, that moral teachings behind it, is something very important. So I said maybe we can take a lesson from that and look at our own dry legalism today in a way that, you know, discovers the intentions behind it and takes a lesson. So uh, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, I, I'm sure that when I'm dying, like in it, hopefully many decades after from now, still there will be some, you know, disturbing things in the Muslim world, but I will hope to see some progress as well. Uh, civilizations don't change overnight. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.